but I wanted to start off talking about the eustachian tube dilation. In the room, who has done a balloon dilation of the eustachian tube? Nice, yeah. So it's one of the kind of the, probably the easiest one we have because you can see right where you're going. You don't need navigation, you don't need a uh, light pipe. It just falls right in. And so I would say the hardest part about balloon dilation of the eustachian tube is getting the patient approved for surgery, right? Even though we have a CPT code now for balloon dilation, it's a challenge. And it's a challenge because a lot of these patients, when you send them for an audiogram, they're, uh, they have pretty normal hearing and their tympanograms type A and they only have dynamic uh, or functional eustachian tube dysfunction. And maybe it's time to get a new computer up here, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll wing it. Um, there's also anatomic eustachian tube dysfunction, so that's when you're gonna find a big nasopharyngeal mass. And um, again, something that you definitely wanna use. Uh, if I'm considering balloon dilation of eustachian tube, I'll use a zero degree endoscope, because that's what I'm probably going to be using when I do the procedure. But the kicker is the barrow-induced eustachian tube dysfunction, right? Those are our classic patients, the scuba divers, the pilots, flight attendants, the people who go skiing a lot, the people who ha only have dysfunction when they're stressing their eustachian tube. And that's a challenge because they, you test them at sea level and they do great. Um, patchless eustachian tube is a whole different topic. Uh, Dennis Poe has done some amazing lectures. There's several of his lectures online, and if you have patients with patchless eustachian tube, I encourage you to YouTube Dennis Poe and, and his lectures on it. Uh, and then whether or not it's acute versus chronic, these are all important things to document in your notes to uh, try to get approval. So with the history, as I said, duration is, is key. Comorbidities with allergic rhinitis, CRS, laryngopharyngeal uh, reflux. Uh, but really looking in the ear, and as a rhinologist, um, I do have a couple otoscopes somewhere in my clinic, but I tend to use the zero or 30 degree endoscope and just get beautiful images with the endoscope. It's really easy to take a look at it. Um, I'll, I'll take a look in the external auditory canal, make sure there's no significant ear pathology. If there is, they're gonna see one of my colleagues. That's beyond my area of expertise. Um, obviously looking in the nasopharynx, looking for things like the JNA or uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, those things can all pick up with uh, anatomic eustachian tube dysfunction. And then a CT scan is required. Uh, it's required, sorry, it's required, there we go. It's required uh, because you're looking for a dehiscent carotid artery, and that would be a contraindication for balloon dilation. As far as I know, there have not been any cases of carotid artery rupture, uh, but something very, very key in the arrows point to that. Uh, tympanogram, it's nice if you can get a type C negative pressure back there, that's wonderful. But again, in many or most of these patients, you're gonna find a type A. Uh, and then one key thing, many payers will now require the eustachian uh, tube dysfunction questionnaire. And this is online. It's a seven question uh, item that's easy to document. And I can't remember what the cutoff is, but uh, at least a few pairs will have a certain number that patients have to meet in order to qualify for this. So you should have this questionnaire available either online or paper format in your uh, clinic note. It's ready to go. Usually patients have to have medical therapy, which is smart. Uh, you know, if they can get by with pseudoephedrine, uh, if they can tolerate allergy medicine and go through all of that, uh, PPIs if they have reflux, frequent valsalvas just to equalize the pressure and to try to negate that constant negative pressure is a key thing. And they, almost everybody needs to have medical therapy for four weeks. Um, then I'll have them come back and that's where we can talk about their options. Um, pressure equalization tube, balloon dilation, or continue medication. And you know, there's problems with the little tubes that people put in. Um, you can't get chronic perforation. Um, it's temporary relief while it's in there. Sometimes that's enough to normalize the tissue. But the bigger thing is like scuba divers. Um, this is diving in Roatan, I highly recommend that. But you can't scuba dive once you have uh, a tube in place or while you have a tube in place. So a lot of commercial divers will come in and they're looking for new options. They've heard about balloon dilation of these station tube and this is a fantastic opportunity for them. Um, these are some of the, oh, here we go. These are the important criteria. So you have to have symptoms for greater than 12 weeks, type B or C tympanogram, and that's the part where we have to push back against the pairs. The eustachian tube dysfunction questionnaire needs to be greater than two and failed medical management. 
Dennis uh, has done a really nice job um, looking at the research for the balloon dilation of the station tube, which I'll talk just a bit about, but here's a nice clinical consensus statement, and this really helps support us. Uh, Ed McCool, a good friend, uh, led this, and you don't have to do a prior myringotomy. That was a, one of the initial criteria. Uh, don't do it on a dehist carotid, and uh, patients with middle ear fusion might benefit from a myringotomy. So if you're looking in their ear before this and they have a middle ear fluid, there is some research that shows if you do a myringotomy at the same time of balloon dilation, they probably will have a better uh, success rate. And definitely do a nasal endoscopy first, not only to look for posterior pathology, but to make sure you have access, right? You wanna know before you go to the operating room, are you gonna have to do a septoplasty or a turbinate out fracture? And the evidence, I'm gonna to skip to the highlight here, the 52-week evidence, that's what patients wanna know. Does it last for a year or longer? 56%, you know, in the best hands. And so that's what I tell my patients, 50-50 chance that this is gonna help your eustachian tube dysfunction, which is kind of a humbling you know, result for us in ENT. We, we like those higher, higher results. I went to a shoulder surgeon and he says, yeah, 50-50 chance your shoulder's gonna feel better afterwards. I'm like, I don't like those odds, you know? And so I think I'll just keep the physical therapy. Um, so this is, you know, compared to sinus surgery and septoplasty surgery where we have such high success rates, for us, this is low. For a lot of surgery fields, this isn't too bad. And it's important to give that patient uh, the proper expectations up front. Uh, you can do it both in the office and in the operating room. If you haven't done it before, definitely do it in the OR a few times. Um, I use just tetracaine gel now, the 10% tetracaine gel. Uh, if I'm gonna do a eustachian tube dilation in the office, I will do a SPA block at the same time. Uh, zero degree endoscope, there's a lot of different balloons you can use now. We have a couple balloons in the lab. Uh, as you know, you just kind of slide it in there and inflate it for two minutes and that's the magic. Now there's a lot of different, uh, Dennis will talk about a lot of different ways and maybe you should do a minute and a half versus a minute depending on how bad the eustachian tube dysfunction is. I think it's nice just to stick it at that two minutes and, and go with that. Here's a short video that just shows uh, atraumatically using this nice gentle tip to feed it into the eustachian tube. There really should be no resistance while you're doing this. And then there's a nice band of yellow that you'll see, and that's where you know to stop, and that doesn't go past that torus tabarius there, and then inflate it for two minutes, and we'll, I won't sit here for two minutes, and you know, you tell jokes, gotta have some jokes ready for your OR team while they're doing this. Uh, and then you pull it out. And there's usually a little bit of blush. Um, there really shouldn't be any significant bleeding after this. And a lot of times you can go in and take a peek up there and uh, sometimes fluid will come down, uh, sometimes not. Nice thing as of January of this year, we have a CPT code. It's either unilateral or bilateral. Uh, for those who like RVUs, uh, yeah, these are the RVUs. So not too bad for the amount of effort it takes. The problem, is when this code was going through CMS and getting approval, there was an oversight. And the oversight is that this bundles with any and every sinus code we have. So you cannot do a balloon dilation, code for it appropriately, and also code for sinus surgery. You won't get paid for the balloon dilation. There's a process in place right now, thanks to the ARS and 3P from the Academy that is trying to change that and should change that within the next year. Uh, but it's something to keep in mind if you're doing sinus surgery on a patient, you won't get reimbursed for this. Um, it's frustrating, but that's the reality. All right, so finally, it's, an, it's a great option for patients who uh, don't want a tube. Do the medical management covered Coverage is a little shaky. And I'm gonna go through just a couple things because I'm excited to get to the lab for balloon sinuplasty. Raise your hand if you've dilated any sinus. Yeah, okay, good. That's what I, that's what I thought. So um, we're gonna go through this very quickly. Does it make holes? Yes. Can you drain fluid after you dilate a sinus? Absolutely. Uh, does it help mucociliary clearance? Yeah. So this is a really nice option if patients have relatively minimal to moderate or minimal sinus disease. How about irrigations? Can you get that fluid in there after balloon dilation? Maybe, but it's tough. You know, maybe a little bit more in the frontal sinus. Um, 
but can you get thick debris out? Can you get a mycetoma out? Why are people ballooning a maxillary sinus that has calcifications in that completely opacified sinus? You can't, you have to scoop that out. You can't even suction it out you know, when you're in the operating room. Uh, <clears throat> and then if there's polyps, really no indication for balloon dilation when you see polyps, unless you're gonna do an in-office polypectomy at the same time, totally legit for that reason. Lots of different balloons, uh, depending on when you train, where, and who you trained with, you'll decide what you like best. Um, I've gone back and forth. I, I, I really like the navigation balloons uh, just because I know for sure where I am. Uh, it's sometimes a little bit more expensive. Patient selection, absolutely key for in-office procedures with everything, and I treat them just like a surgical patient. I tell them the same complications as sinus surgery. I treat them, I have them come in early, they're doing Afrin, two sprays, every ten, they actually do it at home before they come in, along with Tylenol. If you Afrinize them, you can have so much better access versus if they just come to your clinic and your MA sprays Afrin and lidocaine and then you go in and do your injections, it, it's harder. And so just, again, treat them like a, a regular surgery. Tell them that you may take a few days off after work. I hear a lot, I receive videos about surgeons saying, oh, it's in and out, there's a radio ad going on by someone that you're in and out and back to work the next day. Yeah, a lot of patients are, but some patients aren't. So talk to them just like sinus surgery. And then the key thing, before you open up the box, Test that compliance of the middle turbinate. There's nothing worse. We've all had these patients where you know, you're in the OR or you're in clinic and you go to medialize that middle turbinate and it is rock hard. That thing is not going anywhere. And you know if you're in the OR, you're just gonna be able to puncture through the uh, basal lamella and you'll be okay. Uh, but in clinic, that's a, that's a real challenge. I've, I've struggled with that. And it's, it's not fun once you open the box. Here's a nice case, you know, th these are kind of my indications for doing balloon. 42-year-old nurse, she had NKT cell lymphoma of the left side, did her sinus surgery and she had her post-op uh, chemo rads, or radiation, sorry. Um, but then she developed sinus disease on the contralateral side. Nice straight septum, really easy to go in and just dilate that maxillary sinus uh, and flush out and suction out that debris. Another case, this is uh, after a a uh, patient I operated on with uh, EGPA or Shirk strauss disease, the frontal sinus was stenosing. That's what it looked like. Patient was having symptoms, CT scan confirmed the disease and just dilated it in clinic. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. You know, he didn't want to go back to the operating room and so that um, was a nice way to treat that. And the last one here, this is a, a friend of mine. He's a thoracic surgeon, uh, six months of maxillary pressure kind of classic, he was treating himself. He's like, I don't wanna go in and have surgery. And, and so this was his pretty minimal maxillary disease on both sides. Again, nice straight septum, excellent case for balloon dilation in the office. Poor applications. Doc, I have this sinus headache. I know it's the sinus. Barrel pressure headaches. There was a really nice study done by Phil Chen uh, and uh, Chris McMains. And they randomized patients with quote, sinus headaches, negative CT scans, and they did a sham trial. Some of the, half the patients got the balloon dilation to their sinuses, the other half, the patients were dilated just inside the nose. And after six months, there was no difference in outcome. Both groups improved, even the placebo group. So this is not something in the Academy of Sport is, don't do this for sinus headaches, it's not indicated. Um, now, the one caveat with this is I would say the barrel pressure, and that's a little bit different. Let's say you have your flight attendants, your pilots come in, every time I'm descending I get frontal headaches. You know, if they have a, a couple cells that make that area tight and you can't control their allergies or their inflammation, I think there is a role for this, for barrel pressure. All right, complications, they happen. 67 orbit injuries within this time frame that Neil studied. Um, 17 skull base injuries and seven severe epistaxis. You know, you think about when you're doing the frontal sinus balloon, what bone is gonna give first? That's what I'm constantly thinking. Is it gonna be that skull base bone or is it gonna be that auger cell, super auger cell? One of those is gonna give. And if it's the skull base, then you get a CSF leak. So always think about that. Always consent your patients for a CSF leak. Dr. Onstead. There was a death from a frontal sinus balloon uh, in Florida. So, it, I mean, 
it's a lobotomy instrument, right? And so, um, so death is a possible outcome, and, um, and it's been published. So I think the perception is, is that balloons are safer, and I would say balloons are, are definitely not safer. They're just another, they're just another instrument. And so I would, I would definitely keep that in mind when, before you're considering doing a frontal balloon dilation that you really, you're, you're not doing it because it's safer, you're just doing it because it's the better option in this particular patient. Great, and for those watching on Zoom, Dr. Onset was talking about a death in Florida related to balloon dilation of the frontal sinus. And again, just treat it like every other sinus surgery. Consent your patient, go through your exact same process, have someone drive them in. Just because it's done in the office, tell them it's surgery. It's not a procedure, this is surgery. And when they get the bill, it's gonna say surgery. It's not gonna say procedure, it's gonna say surgery. So um, it reinforces that ahead of time as well. Um, and death also occurs obviously with sinus surgery. It's not just the balloon. So again, <laughs> treated the same. Uh, in summary, the dilation is really well for minimal to moderate sinus disease without polyps. It's safe, but it has its own complications just like regular sinus surgery and patient selection is key. My last slide is for those of you visitors to Seattle that haven't seen our mountain. This is it. This is from the top of Crystal Mountain, one of my favorite ski areas in the, in the area. And uh, it's not out yet. It's just uh, unfortunately, we have a low cloud cover today, but uh, if the balloon comes out, you'll see all the native Seattleites like run to the windows and say, oh my gosh, the balloons or the, the mountains out. And it's just because we only see it like 100 days a year, I, I think is the average. It's kind of sad. Uh, we're going to transition over to the lab.